Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope uh, everyone enjoyed the social last night and the GIS game. Uh, it looked uh, like a very nice atmosphere virtually. So I would like to offer everyone a very warm welcome. I'm delighted to be chairing uh, today's uh, keynote uh, by Alessandra Fajan. So a very warm welcome to Alessandra. Uh, Alessandra Fajan is a professor of applied economics and uh, director of uh, social sciences as well as Vice Provost for Research at uh, the Grand Sasso Science Institute in L'Aquila, a uh, beautiful L'Aquila in Italy. I don't think L'Aquila was in the game yesterday. It would have been fun to have it also as a street, but uh, it's a be very beautiful place. If you haven't been there, I would strongly recommend it. Uh, Alessandra is a, a very prominent and leading scholar in uh, regional science with signif a really significant publication record in a really wide range of topics, including migration, human, human capital, She's going to talk about this today, labor markets, creativity, local innovation and growth, and many other things. And she has also been, she was the past president of the North American Regional Science Council and current co-editor of uh, the Journal of Regional Science, as well as previous editor of the Journal Papers in Regional Science. So I am, with, without further ado, I'd like to offer the floor or the Zoom or the screen to Alessandra. Alessandra, a very warm welcome and very much looking forward to your, your talk. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitris, and thank you, Jauke, for the invitation. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here with you today. So uh, I always like to teach to young people and, you know, but also see some familiar faces, of course. Uh, hi, Bart, I've just seen you. <laughs> um, right, so um, this morning, as Dimitri was saying, uh, oh, thank you very much, Dimitri, for very prominent. I always find like people are exaggerating when they introduce me, <laughs> kind of embarrassing. But anyway, uh, so uh, uh, this morning I decided I've, I've thought a lot about what to talk about uh, today. And uh, uh, I've talked about different things in recent uh, times. I've talked about uh, rural areas. I've talked about resilience, uh, disasters, uh, international immigration. At the end, I decided that today I wanted to kind of repropose a talk that I've given not that long ago, recently at the International Regional Science Association uh, keynote, which was about my original love. As Dimitri said, uh, I did my PhD on interregional uh, migration uh, and human capital. So my background is a little bit from labor economics and then I moved a little bit towards geography. I looked at mobility of highly skilled individuals. And that has always been a topic that accompanied me throughout my career. And I'm still working on this. And of course, I'm trying to find new uh, angles and new uh, things to study uh, on these. So because this is a summer school, I just wanted to show you a little bit uh, uh, where I started, where I'm currently working on, and also what are, according to me, the potentials in these uh, fields, uh, and also what kind of new techniques uh, uh, we are applying at the GSSI in the hope of finding some new interesting results. So now I'm gonna start sharing my screen. And so my talk, as I, as I said, it's about uh, human capital migration. So the migration of highly skilled people. And I'm gonna talk about the past, the present and the future. And uh, so this is kind of a joke because uh, when I actually looked at, uh, when I started working on this, I realized that I started working on this topic uh, 21 years ago. And I can guarantee you, and probably, you know, Dimitris can tell you the same, that when we look back, it feels like 10 years, not 21. So when you actually look and you count, uh, it's kind of scary. And that was my face when I realized uh, how long ago that was. It, it doesn't really feel that, that much. And so what was the, the um, turning point in my career, let's say? Well, I went to the UK and at the time, micro data were becoming available, but they were not still as common as you are used to nowadays. And so I started working with Professor Phil McCann and um, he had these uh, uh, new sets of data. They were data on individuals and he had millions of observation on these individual. Sorry, I'm just turning my WhatsApp off. Otherwise they will, it's always like this. 
I forget. Um, okay, um, and so I had these millions of observations, and this was a new thing. And even microeconometrics techniques uh, were difficult to be used because you didn't really have good data. But here I come, and I start my PhD, and I have all this data on all the students in the UK. It was not a sample; it was the population of students in the UK, and the good sample, about fifty percent of these students that graduated were also responding to this national survey. So I had a sample which was about 50% of the whole population. So it was a little bit daunting at the beginning because, uh, sounds funny, but 21 years ago, we didn't have the computers that we have now. So handling millions of observation meant that uh, during my PhD, I had to have long coffees while my computer was actually running the data and trying to do some kind of modeling or simulation of the data that I was using. That was a plus, by the way, because I, I got to have coffee while I was working. Um, but anyway, so it was kind of uh, uh, interesting, but at the same time, it had some challenges uh, back then. Uh, and also, uh, of course, I was interested in the migration uh, of these uh, highly skilled individuals because I had the location where they were initially starting at, so the parental domicile or the, the domicile before uh, studying, then I knew what and where they studied, and I also knew <clears throat> where eventually they end up working after graduation. <clears throat> and so I was really interested in this sequential migration issue. Um, and so I, I, I wanted to find out who were the most mobile individuals, where they were going, and so on. And that was fitting very well in the migration literature at the time, because the migration literature um, can be uh, broadly speaking, can be divided into two main streams. One is looking at the determinants of migration that goes for interregional, international, whatever. The other one is looking at the consequences of migration. So what are the effects of these migrants on the local economies, on the country? You hear that a lot when you talk about international migrants, right? Where they're all worried about what's going to be the effect on the local labor market if we have these waves of international migrants coming in, are the local people going to be harmed and lose their job and whatever. So these were the two, um, um, broadly speaking, even when you read uh, all the um, surveys that there are around, these are mainly, you know, the two uh, side of the same coin. And in fact, if you are interested in migration studies, I suggest that you read a couple of reviews by Michael Greenwood. They are old now, but they summarize well the literature, uh, the, the main issues that are still there in the literature nowadays. Right. So, uh, so I started looking uh, first at the migration determinants, because having all this fine detail uh, data, I thought, well, OK, let's see who are the people that move and also why, what kind of regional characteristics are important for their movement. And because also th this was the kind of uh, first uh, innovation in my studies, it was that I just I wasn't just looking at one migration movement, but I was looking at two migration movement in a sequence. Uh, so what I call the sequential migration path. So I, I initially started classifying people or students and graduates into five categories, repeat migrants, which were the ones that were studying away from the parental domicile, but also move again to work in a different location. Then I had return migrants, which were the ones that were moving away, but then actually they were deciding to, for some kind of reason, come back home after studying. Then I had the ones that were actually then getting stuck pass me this term, into the university location once they finish uh, their studies. And in a sense, these are the ones that all the universities are trying to get. So at the GSSI, which is in L'Aquila, it's not in Rome, it's not in a large city, what I'm trying to do is get people here and then get them into the local labor market, right? This is the attraction we, of human capital we, we often talk about. 
Um, then we had the late migrants. These were people that prefer to actually stay put, to study, stay at home. But then later on, for some reasons, um, most of them were actually because they were doing very well at university, decided that to actually find a good job, they had to move away. And then I called them the non-migrants. Initially, Phil was calling them the stickers. But for me, <laughs> it sounded a bit offensive. So I prefer to call them non-migrants. And these were the ones that no matter what, they study at home, they work at home, they never move. Uh, obviously, they also have the possibility to study in their home location, which means normally they are in larger cities or uh, uh, territorial context where there is a university. Otherwise, obviously, you have to move uh, by necessity, not by choice. So I looked at that. <clears throat> And uh, by looking at their determinants in terms of individual characteristics, but also some of uh, uh, regional characteristics, uh, the interesting results that came out from the initial studies of interregional migration determinants was that the female graduates were a lot more dichotomous in their uh, choices than the male graduates. And here I always make a, a joke because I always say, well, you know, women are very decisive. So it's either black or white, but nothing in the middle. And this seemed a little bit the case. Of course, it's a joke. Um, so um, female were actually either repeat migrants or more likely to be non-migrants while the male graduates were kind of clustering more in the uh, middle categories, not the more migratory, but not the less, the least migratory. So the university stayer or the return migrants tend to be more male than female, taking into account also all the other, um, all the other dimensions. Also, and that was not a, a surprise, uh, repeat migrants were in general younger. It's kind of well known now in the migration literature, not only interregional but also international, that age is a factor in fostering uh, your migration. The younger you are, the less you are attached to a place. Uh, also, the less specific human capital you have, you have all this generic human capital, but you haven't started working in a specific field and whatever. So you're free, more free to move. And plus you have in front of you all these years to kind of recoup the cost of migration. So it's obvious that the younger you are, uh, the, the more mobile you are. Um, and also, and this is why we started calling it uh, human capital migration, we didn't have uh, different proper level of human capital, but we knew who were the higher achievers uh, at university and who were the ones that actually were not doing that great. And what we found is that the higher achievers, the one that ended up with the first, which is the, the top grade in the UK, were actually the one that were moving the most afterwards. The ones that actually did not do so well, so the one that just got a pass or a third, which is the lowest grade in the UK, were actually return migrants. In a sense, yes, they were migrating, but back home. And so, uh, this was also in line with some of the contribution from demographers, actually not from economists. There wasn't very much at that time when I was doing this um, in, in economics, but there was a lot in demography. And uh, there was this, uh, this um, uh, stream of literature led by Julie Davanzo, who was a demographer who was studying the difference between repeat and return migration. And she was actually pointing out that return migration often is a corrective movement. And that is what we found. We found that actually the one that didn't do that well at university were going back to the original uh, domicile. Uh, whether they were going back to their exact parental domicile or not, well, we actually checked that by restricting also to the postcode of the parents. And in the UK, you have like 2 million postcode, you have like 15, 20 houses in each postcode. And we found out that that was also the case. So they were really <laughs> going back home to their parents and especially the students in particular field Hence, then we started looking at this particular field, which was the creative graduates, the one that were studying arts, because what we found in the original contributions that if you were studying arts or even natural science, but especially arts, you were a lot more likely to go back to the exact postcode of your parents. In a sense, you know, it, it was a corrective movement because maybe they were less 
past me this term marketable than other uh, skills. Uh, <clears throat> and then we also found uh, uh, some regional uh, dimensions. So, for instance, in uh, Scotland, uh, a lot, uh, a lot more uh, students were likely to be non-migrants. But that was also a factor. Uh, that was also um, due to the distribution of universities in Scotland, because and the distribution of population. Basically, in Scotland, most of the population. Uh, is in large cities where you have universities, so you don't really need, unless you move from Glasgow to Edinburgh, but uh, otherwise you normally study at home, so that was, uh, <clears throat> that was a factor. But also they were finding the first job in the same labor market where they were studying. I also want to point out while I go through this, something that I've added to my last talk, the type of methodology that I use in the different paper, that was kind of more self-reflection. I was just interested in myself in finding out whether I use different methodologies or whether I was using always the same. In fact, in this uh, <coughs> paper, I used the discrete choice models and that's how I kind of got into the discrete choice models, which are these uh, models, and I'm sure you all know that, uh, that allow you to have a dependent variable, which is not continuous, but categorical. Here I had five categories. So I needed, uh, uh, I needed to, to uh, use these discrete choice models. Uh, I point out the methodology. You'll see that by chance almost, I got different methodologies in, in the different papers and then in different uh, um, um, phenomena that I studied. But I want to point out that I've seen uh, now, you know, few students throughout the years, uh, whether it was in the UK, in the US or in Italy, starting from the methodology and then try to find the research question. That is not what I did. And I suggest that you don't do that. I find that sometimes uh, in, in their PhD, the students want to wow, you know, the, the supervisor or the referee or whatever with the new model. So they start from that and then they try to find an idea to fit that model. Please don't do that because it's important to find the right methodology, but always start from your intuition of the world. You look at the literature, you find something that nobody has done either because of lack of data or because simply they didn't think about that hypothesis. Think about the intuition that you have that you wanna prove and start from that. So that's why I put the methodology there because uh, I don't want you to, you know, to go the other way around, even though these are all different things. Um, then we started looking also, so normally when you look at the uh, migration study, uh, you don't look at directions. You look at uh, initial point, end point, maybe distance, uh, determinants, but it's always kind of unidimensional uni what you are looking at. You are a migrant, you are not a migrant. Uh, did you move? How far did you move? But it's a line. But we were also interested in looking at the directions of the movement. So together with uh, actually a common friend, because they all know him as well, which is Jonathan Corcoran, who is a geographer, um, we started looking at where people towards which direction people were moving. And we use this uh, circular statistics methodology to look at the average direction of a movement. You can do that with, with some tricks uh, and you have like a cone of the average direction, right? And it's funny, so this is, a, a, of course, a different, longer paper with a lot more stuff in it. But I thought of showing you the map that clearly shows you that everybody well, the majority of people, the average direction was London, because clearly the UK has a primate city, which is London, and then the rest. So when you do these migration studies, you always have to <clears throat> kind of do this with or without London, because London, it's an economy per se. And if you look at this, uh, here is the, um, uh, wind, the, the, roses, the wind roses uh, that shows you the direction, you can see kind of they all point <laughs> towards the same direction, which is London. And I thought it was kind of fun. And if you are interested in studying uh, migration, I think you might want to look into also these circular statistics methodology, uh, given that you have an idea to apply this methodology, because I think it's uh, underestimated and underused. I haven't seen very many papers uh, using this. And this one was actually published long ago in, in papers in regional science. Okay. 
Um, but then, as I said, uh, it wasn't enough just looking at the determinants. Uh, I wanted to move into also looking at the consequences of human capital migration. So I'm giving you an excursus of how my way of thinking uh, progressed over the years. Uh, I haven't done all these during my PhD. I've done that over you know, a long span of time. Um, adding pieces. So I started with another thing that my advisor always told me is that for one paper, you need a very good idea. Another thing that I've seen a lot of people doing is trying to prove four ideas in the same paper and do it in a shallow way and bad. No, it's better to actually have one idea good one and then try to test it carefully rather than you know wow people with i've had all these many results and all these many tables so over time i tried to kind of build these were my building blocks to try and understand better the the phenomenon that i was studying uh, so on one side of course uh, the first thing that we thought and this was a paper that was co-authored with Phil was to look at how human capital migration all this inflow of uh, knowledge skills and whatever was helping or not the innovation of regions and that was a paper also that uh, came out at the very beginning in time though I was also interested in looking at the individual consequences so if you move it's obvious that according to the the utility theory you have to have some kind of benefit otherwise it would be stupid to move right and so if that's the case we wanted to look at the effect of migration on salary first but also in time we got new data where they were also asking people uh, about their uh, job satisfaction and we wanted to see whether it was just the salary it was just satisfaction it was a little bit of both so if migrating was also in a sense improving your quality of life in terms of job satisfaction. So let's start with the, the salaries. So um, what we did, we studied the relationship between migration and salaries about, uh, well, a little bit less than 200,000 uh, graduates of which 72% were in the labor market uh, and answered the questionnaire. And we found, kind of expecting it, that the biggest returns were for repeat migration. So you migrate twice because you know that that gives you higher returns. And in fact, we use matching techniques and we found different uh, uh, magnitude of the coefficient, but it was always over 10%. So if you are willing to move, it's because they give you a higher salary and that is at least 10%. Um, what was interesting though, and again, that kind of confirmed our idea that the return migration was a corrective movement, the people that were actually going back home were actually worse off than the people that were not moving at all. So, you know, combined with the fact that there was of course a negative self selection probably because they were the lowest achievers, this was kind of building up our story that return migration was not really a choice, but was a little bit more of a necessity. Um, so uh, then we also looked at, because we noticed that in the return migrants category, there were um, a, a lot more, say, creative graduates, so a lot more students that were studying these uh, arts uh, kind of uh, subjects, we, were, we looked into the same just for the creative graduates. And here we have a series of paper on this topic. But the interesting thing was that when we were presenting these, especially in front of people that are doing creative studies, we were always told, well, because you are looking at the wrong thing, the creative graduates don't care at all about the salary. They're very, you know, bohemian. They look at different things. And so salary is not a good variable to look at when you look at this particular group of people. And then there was a longitudinal survey that came out where they were asking them about job satisfaction. And so in a sense, this contribution came up because uh, um, we noticed that this salary gap was persistent over time. It lasted for three and a half, four years after graduation. But we were wondering if despite this salary, these people, because of the different value system they had in mind, maybe they were happy, right? You, you can have a lower salary and be happy. I moved from the US to Italy, I can guarantee you I have a much lower salary, but I'm happier. So could have been something like that, right? Um, but uh, 
even looking at the job satisfaction, the results were very similar. And in fact, they were the least satisfied at all. So that was kind of a question mark for do we need that many creative graduates? At that point in the UK, there was a policy focus on these creative graduates. A lot of people were saying, you know, we need more, we need people to be creative. Maybe they pushed the policy agenda a little bit too far uh, because probably the supply and demand should have been uh, realigned a little bit at that time. That was why we were starting this. Uh, and then, of course, the, the other big uh, uh, effect can be on the regional economy. And here is where we looked at uh, the relationship between uh, uh, human capital migration and innovation. Here I put in green so that you can see that we use patents. Now I'm working with a lot of innovation economists. I've hired a few here in Italy. So we do uh, regional, but we also do a lot of studies on innovation, always with the territorial regional focus, of course. And even now they all use patents as a way to measure innovation. That drives me crazy a little bit because uh, especially doing a lot of work now on peripheral areas, we perfectly know that innovations are a very rough way of measuring, uh, sorry, patents are a very rough way of measuring innovation that leaves out a lot of these uh, uh, innovative experiences, for instance, in peripheral areas or in services or things that are not patented. But, you know, it was 2009, so I used patents. <laughs> and uh, back then, what we did find, it was that the effect of universities on innovation didn't seem to be related so much uh, to the phenomenon of spin-off uh, startups. You know, these are very important, but in terms of numbers, uh, there were not probably enough in numbers to really make a difference to the regional economy. But the fact that the university was a conduit of human capital, so attractive of students, and then retaining them, so the university stayer category, or even the non-migrants, right, the one that were not going away, we actually found that that was probably the, the most important effect. And that was the main, uh, the main result of this paper of 2009. So I'm giving you all these courses. I have till what time, Dimitris? So I you have a, a, another half an hour. You can okay, take, okay, yeah. okay, perfect, okay. So I'm giving you all these courses because first of all, I wanted to show you where the migration studies were, uh, but also. Um, Everything in your life, in a sense, uh, academic life has to have a feel rouge, right? So this was where I started. And then in time, I started thinking about other things. So right now, because finally we have better data on innovation that include also other forms of innovation, which are not just patents, but are also trademark and design rights, which are better, more used in the services. And because in time, right, we, we kind of have plenty of evidence that the most highly skilled migrants end up working in advanced service sectors where patents are heavily underestimating innovation. I'm, right now, I'm working with uh, uh, one postdoc researcher here at the GSSI, one professor at the University of Kieta, which is in the Kieti, which is in the same region where I am, a little bit uh, further away, and with Carolina Castal. The Carolina Castal is from Utrecht University because I do like the Dutch people, um, although she's Italian, but she speaks very well Dutch because now she's basically naturalized. Uh, she, she would never come back to Italy. Um, so Carolina is well known to have studied in time other forms of intellectual property rights other than uh, innovation. And so I was just wondering, okay, nobody has done it, at least not for Italy, at least not in this detail, uh, with these details data. So we had a chat and we started looking at the relationship between migration, interregional migration and other forms of innovation, trademarks and design rights. Um, we apply this analysis to the Italian case study from 2003 to 2012, so we have 10 years. And first of all, what we noticed is that trademarks and design rights have been increasing quite a bit between 2003 and 2012 in Italy, but surprisingly, this is very important, in the South. So in Italy, we have a North-South divide, right? And uh, the, 
the South needs to do something in a sense, be innovative in some kind of innovation to kind of catch up and do something. And it's a lot more, it's a lot easier <clears throat> to actually have a trademark or a design be more spread in the territory rather than uh, patents, which you know have requirements that maybe only certain regions can match. So anyway, so we looked at that. And so we started thinking, okay, maybe there's something in there. This is the distribution of uh, international immigration. So we looked at both international and interregional migration. This is the distribution of interregional immigration by skills. As you know, the immigrants come from the south. They normally come from, to, they, they, they arrive by sea in this small island in the south of Italy. That's why you see Sicily and Calabria, which are the two bottom regions, these ones. So dark. Then there's kind of a filtering process where basically the, moving up, you have more kind of highly uh, skilled international migrants. So that's the distribution. This is the interregional migration. The story of interregional migration will never change in Italy. It will always tell you a story of a north of a south north divide because people from the south leave, uh, highly skilled people from the south, young especially, leave to go to the north. And that no matter, you know, I can show you maps from decades ago, it, it, it will always be like this. So you have this flow uh, from the north. In, in fact, the small pockets that we have of highly skilled people are not interregional migrants, are international migrants. In a sense, if some parts of the South wants to kind of have, be more innovative, they should uh, bet more on, in a sense, migrants from outside than from inside. Uh, so anyway, so we, we looked at innovation and that's three level. I'm not showing you uh, everything, but this is a kind of summary, uh, well, long, long list of variable, blah, blah, blah. I just wanted to show you here where we are at. So what we found, and that's very important, is that if you look at the content of human capital of migrants, and then you divide them by international and interregional, the effects on patents, trademarks, and design rights, it's not the same. And that was the first result, because we could have got all the same uh, sign and instead we have different signs. We are still working on this, so we are not absolutely certain about all the dimensions of this, but it was already very important that, for instance, highly skilled interregional migrants, so the Italian basically, are affecting the number of patents and trademarks very much. We are controlling for regional characteristics and whatever, but this comes out as being positive and significant. The medium low, the opposite, they are always, uh, they always have a negative effect on, on uh, general average innovation. For the international migration though, they enter into services probably or into sectors where the highly skilled one have more of a positive effect on trademarks as well, but on design, right? While they are insignificant for patents. So that it's a different type of people in a sense. And that's where we wanna go more in depth and study a little bit more th their characteristics. The medium low one have a negative effect. So here there is not much difference between the two types of population. But this was because, you know, long ago, 2009, I only studied patents. And so now 10 years and, uh, afterwards, uh, I want to actually go more in depth into different types of innovation. Also, another thing that became very, you know, kind of fashionable, uh, it's in all, I guess, the national plan for resilience and recovery. It is definitely in our Italian plan of uh, resilience and recovery is the green transition, right? Sustainability and, and so on. So given this growing interest on sustainability and green activities, we wanted to look at the relationship between human capital migration and sustainable economic activities. In fact, there was a paper in 2011, which was called Human Capital and Sustainability. I just recently found it. So these, these two guys were actually way ahead of, of our time because we were, they were really looking at human capital and sustainability, but they are the only ones. And they, they, it's more conceptual rather than uh, empirical. Um, also, we found out that the European Commission in 2020 had a taxonomy of environmentally sustainable economic activities, 
which was uh, published. Um, and so this EU taxonomy is a classification system establishing a list of environmentally sustainable economic activities. And in a sense, they say it's an important enabler to scale up sustainable investment and to implement the European Green Deal. Here you have the list at the bottom. You can actually have a look. You have all the kind of you know, codes that you need to identify these activities, which I haven't done because Adriana Pinate, who is a very good uh, Venezuelan uh, postdoc working uh, with me, and Martina Dalmurin, who is a, a researcher here, they did it, they looked at the, this classification, they classified the activities, and this is, uh, um, sorry, I have to move your faces because otherwise I can't see <laughs> the maps. <laughs> okay. Um, and so this is the employment growth uh, of sustainable activity at provincial level in Italy from 2009 to 2018. And so we have the overall picture, which tells you a story of, you know, basically not, not that doesn't tell you very much we were not very sustainable in that period uh, but then if you divide them into manufacturing and services the services are telling you a little bit of, of a more interesting story and here the interesting story is that aside from Milan which you know it's, it's my seat in the center of Lombardy the north which is a little bit more industrial but also the center is not really into um, these uh, uh, sustainable green services, but there's something going on in the South. So we, we want to look at this, probably again, right? Out of necessity, they have to be more innovative, more to the point that they can also receive more European funds, of course, this region. And so they need to be on top with what is really important. What is really important in Europe now is green activities. And in a sense, the picture of services starting telling us something. We don't know yet what, but just started telling us something which was interesting. A little bit more of an heterogeneous picture compared to the, the other two. Uh, so here we have some uh, uh, results. I won't discuss that very much. We started with OLS, then we went to two SLS. We divide manufacturing and services. We control for endogeneity. We use IVs of two different uh, types. Having said all that, uh, what we did find is that the 1% increase in the share of highly skilled migrants is associated with a 6.2% increase in the employment growth of sustainable activities while a 1% increase in the share of low skilled migrants is associated with a decrease of 3.9%. So we did find some kind of positive relationship between skills, again, and this kind of more sustainable economic activities. Uh, this is a working paper I don't have, well, we have written it, but we don't have a final version yet. Probably once it will be done, it will be out in the working paper series that we have, but we're still working on it. But the, let's say that the first results are at least intriguing. And so we keep on working on this topic. Okay, so I think I'm, uh, um, I'm actually gonna finish probably before 10.30. Um, so these are two, uh, I have other things that are connected, but these are the two papers that I wanted to show you because in a sense, they, they answer different questions, but they all progress from the past in the sense that, well, I knew there was a gap in the innovation part of my paper, so I tried to fill that gap. And this one came out because the focus of the world, the policy changed over time. So this was an interesting thing to start looking at in a period in which we are going to invest massive amount of money into uh, these uh, green and sustainable activities. And by the way, um, my actual degree is in environmental economics. So nobody knows that, but I, I've never studied regional economics when I was at university. I only started studying it after university, but I'm actually, I have a degree in environmental economics. So this is like going back to something that I wanted to do, you know, 25 years ago or so. Okay, so the future. Uh, right, so I think that now we are facing uh, a lot of challenges. The first of which is that I'm too old to actually handle big data, <laughs> I'm joking. But in a sense, the first is that now we are going from micro data to big data. And uh, 
thank God there are like a lot of people here at the GCSI that are at least 10 years younger than me that know exactly how to scrap data from the internet. Or we also have a, a um, computer science department. So we, we often go to the young people in the computer science department and ask them for help. But the, the point is that now there are a lot more data. I was struggling in finding micro data when I started my PhD. Now we're not talking about micro data anymore. Now we're talking about this immensely huge amount of data that you can find. And these are also misleading because then really the, the, the research can become data driven, which is not what we want. But you really, if you know how to do it, there are plenty of data that you can get out there. Um, so uh, there is a lot of potential. There are also a lot of dangers, I think. You know, it's easy to get fascinated by having zillions of data and not really think about what kind of idea you're trying to, to, to develop. Um, but so uh, recently I've worked on two different types of data. One was data on uh, tweets. So we got the tweets from Twitter and with the uh, um, students of mine, Daria Denti, uh, we looked at uh, online hatred and we did the uh, uh, textual analysis, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Even more recently, going back to the phenomenon of migration, we use Facebook data to study the relationship between mobility into and inter local labor markets and the spread of COVID. And by the way, two days ago, this paper was accepted. Uh, and so it's forthcoming in structural and change and economic dynamics. I think I, I always mess up the name of the, but I think that's the, the, the right one. So it's now it's forthcoming. Um, and so what uh, uh, my co-author, especially Andrea Scani and Alessandro Palma, who are two very bright young people, did was getting this data. They were actually publicly available. You had to go through some hoops uh, to get them, but they, they, you, they were publicly available. And they were very high frequency data. So you had three uh, observations per day three times a day, you were observing these movements. These were all the Facebook users. So the sample was extremely large. We are also using kind of uh, higher um, performance computing machine in some of these things when we really need to, to do more a lot of uh, calculations. Um, so it was a very large sample and we were looking at the basically intraflow density. So be, within local labor markets and between local labor markets before and after the lockdown, because we had this data throughout the old 2020. So we were observing when the Italian government were locking, was locking people in, uh, when actually it was opening up, how this was affecting the spread of COVID. Um, so it, it it was really interesting. Of course, we one of the uh, comments that we got back from the referees when we presented this uh, paper was that uh, uh, Facebook users are not young anymore. I'm a Facebook user, so I kind of got a little bit upset about being called old, but that's how it seems it is. You know, Facebook Facebook users are now you know middle age to say the, the best. And so they were saying, oh, but you're not really looking at young people. So we had to kind of go back. It's true. Even with this big data, you will always have a kind of sample selection that you have to acknowledge. Uh, but, you know, well, we were talking about really so many observations that we thought it was a good sample. Um, and so what we, so what we found, oops, uh, we, we looked at the different, for instance, we found that uh, the intra flows were associated with the higher, faster spread of COVID than the interflow because the interflow between different local labor markets were between different provinces and regions and they were in a sense more controlled. People were actually only traveling if they really had a necessity to do so, otherwise they were kind of more uh, cautious. The intraflows between the local labor markets, uh, people were feeling a little bit more confident, right? And so probably they were not even, 
in a sense, they were feeling confident because they were closer to home, but th th it doesn't really matter how far or close you are to home. If you are infected, you are infected. It's not like because you feel more confident, that's okay. But anyway, we found different uh, uh, effects over time um, of these. Okay, so I wanted to point out though, the, as I said, not just the potential, but also the problems. So it is very easy, believe me, because I, after so many years in research, I can still do it myself. Very easy to get lost in such a mass of data. In fact, we are four authors and the few initial um, meetings uh, were all about, uh, okay, so these are the kind of you know, statistics that we have. Uh, look at the phenomenon. Does it actually tell the story that we have in mind? Um, and then, you know, what kind of, what is the, the appropriate way of analyzing it? But also you need to have appropriate tools of analysis, the appropriate model, for instance, you know, thinking about what kind of sample selection you have and so on. But even, and it seems silly, but you need even need to have the appropriate hardware and software. It's not, this data cannot be um, handled by, my laptop, which is a very tiny one, <laughs> will never be able to do that. You need something. And then I think the biggest issue with this uh, uh, big data is the issue of privacy and anonymity. We heard about, you know, Cambridge Analytics and all these. The fact is that while with my data, which were micro data, I didn't know the name of the people, but I knew their individual characteristics. When you go into big data, it's virtually impossible to have actually detailed characteristics of the observation. We knew nothing about the people who were commuting. We couldn't answer uh, whether you know our, our Facebook users were actually really not that young, they were middle-aged or whatever, because we know nothing about them. And so it should be because right, we have given all this information for free, but we don't want the information to be spread around. So there are pros and cons. Uh, and, but sometimes these are actually difficult to, to use and difficult to get, and you can't get all you want. I, in a sense, you sacrifice the quality of data for the quantity of data. You have so many, but then you don't really know much about these observations. But anyway, something that at least um, as a young researcher, you need to be aware of uh, because a lot of research is going into the direction of trying to find uh, smart ways of using this big data. The second thing that we are doing here at the GSSI actually is something that goes back maybe to my own personal interest in psychology. Uh, not that I wanted to be a psychologist, but I've always read a lot about you know, behaviors of people. Uh, and so we got in touch with a group of behavioral economists, and this was especially after the COVID or during the COVID, because during the COVID, I got asked a lot, so do you think that people are now going to move into the peripheries? Do you think that people are, I don't know, but as an economist, I'm studying the behavior of people, and I'm really interested in finding out whether their preferences, their utility function, whatever, has changed for good. But to actually understand that, you have to understand the psychological effect of COVID on the individual choices. Uh, now there is this uh, field which is behavioral economics, uh, which looks into kind of you know the the biases that we have when we make a choice, right? The fact that the in group versus the out group, the fact that because I'm female, if I'm not aware of it, I might uh, favor female, right? There is a gender bias as well, so I have to be aware of the biases I have. There are so many internal cognitive biases that guide our choices. And so we want to look at, at that a little bit more. And, and so we are now looking into acquiring, we are buying these uh, experimental neuroscience tools that can be applied to study differences in decision-making. For instance, uh, I would be interested in finding out uh, if uh, there is a different decision-making process between migrants and non-migrants. Or uh, I might subdivide migrants into subgroup by gender or education and whatever. And these tools uh, go from the face reading, 
so they, they can look at, the, you ask them question and then they can read their expression to the eye reading, the eye track, to the mouse track. So you have a questionnaire that says yes or no, right? But according to how fast with the mouse they go to yes or no, you can study the path. Uh, if they do like this, if they go straight, these are just some examples. But it, it's fascinating because you can actually see if you have a, a sample large enough, if there is a difference between different groups. This is not something new. In fact, I've always been kind of interested in looking at the, the different uh, uh, personality traits, say, of the migrants versus non-migrants. And so in, 2000, in 2021, there is this paper that came out uh, uh, with one of my PhD students in the US. So we've been working for quite a while and now it came out in 2021. And we had this uh, survey in which they were asking them, self-reported, their five big personality traits. So uh, extraversion, agreeableness, consciousness, emotional stability, openness to new experiences. I'm, I'm just self-reported, so I'm not sure how many people will tell you that they are emotionally unstable, but maybe there are some. Um, and so what we found is that migrants exhibit greater extraversion and openness to new experiences on average, which makes sense, and is consistent with the story of being outgoing and willing to take risks. But interesting, migrants are also less agreeable I, I, I can recognize myself in that, uh, conscientious and emotionally stable, right? Uh, but however, these are self-reported, but it could be interesting if you can kind of test then what they're saying with some kind of more objective tool, because if you find that uh, there is a different risk aversion of migrants, uh, you know, this could also be linked, for instance, to a different attitude towards entrepreneurship and or innovation, because risk is linked to entrepreneurship. Conclusion. Okay, future looks bright. Yes, we need some kind of positive statement at the end of the pandemic. Uh, there are new data and new tools. They are coming out now, but a lot more will, will come out. And so these will help us improve the understanding of many economic phenomena, for instance, migration. And personally, the more I study migration, the less I know, <laughs> pretty much, to summarize this sentence. So the more questions open up in my mind. Uh, and then the more I realize that human beings are really complicated. Now, one of our biggest department here at the GSSI is physics. And they always come with this theory and they say, why, why don't you test this? But what kind of general uh, theory you have about migrants? And I always have to explain to them that I'm dealing with humans. They're dealing with atoms, it's slightly different because my humans are a lot more complicated. And so I can't have a general theory of the universe, you know, as they do, because in a sense, think about that. We are studying very complicated human beings with so many different uh, um, facets, right? But the good is that the, I become more curious about that. And so in a sense, I think I could go on and study migration for a long time because as I said here, knowledge has a beginning but no end. So I really... I'm really aware that now I probably know less about migrants than I knew when I started. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alessandra, for a really fascinating and thought provoking uh, presentation. Uh, virtual round of applause. And uh, I would like now to invite everyone to uh, ask any questions or offer reflections, comments. Uh, so, Felipe. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I just have a question about patents. Uh, you were criticizing the work that is done recently on patents because we have better data. So, I actually came across and I'm trying to work with patents in Japan with some colleagues from Japan. And I'm wondering, well, what kind of work do you think is worth it these days if we have other new types of data to measure innovation? So just to clarify, are we still recording? Otherwise, the, the, my colleagues on economics of innovation, they will kill me. I'm not criticizing all the work that is coming out using patents. I'm just saying we have to be very honest about the limitation of patents. So keep on using the patents in Japan. But if you are looking at innovation and you have a mixture of rural and urban areas, 
and it comes out that in the peripheral uh, regions there are no there is no innovation well you know preface it by saying that patents are not a good measure in rural areas mm -hmm. For instance, so it's all about being aware of the limitation of what you are using. If that's the best that we can get, uh, we we don't stop doing research because it's imperfect. We just acknowledge that it's imperfect and we apply it to a context that makes sense. So, for instance, being a regional economist, you know, uh, make sure that you also take into account uh, that you might underestimate uh, innovation in certain regions uh, and, in a sense, uh, overestimate it in other regions because, for instance. Instance, there are centers in which you register the patents, but maybe the patent was not produced, neither used there. Okay, so this is like my, uh, I actually believe that uh, there are like community innovation surveys that can help with getting uh, finer uh, details on the innovation. The problem I now I haven't used the community innovation survey for a very long time last time was in the UK and so then I moved to the US and I moved to Italy so it might be at least 10 years ago. But I remember, for instance, that doing regional economics with the community innovation survey data on innovation was difficult because at the time when I was using it, the CIS was not stratified by regions, not at the level that I was, I wanted to use them so again. Uh, you could you could do some research, but you couldn't really have a sample which was representative of the NAS three regions or whatever. Uh, there are always going to be compromise. Just be honest. I think it's better to be honest uh, in, in acknowledging and also rational in, for instance, the the, the application. I, now I don't know what you are studying in Japan. If you are studying Japan in general and you're not interested in territorial like difference between rural and urban, I guess that's fine. Also, always look very uh, carefully at the notes that normally come with the survey that collects the data, because that also tells you maybe if they are over oversampling certain areas or certain uh, maybe they're oversampling in certain industries or they have they've included services or whatever you know i'm pretty sure that now they're all trying to sort out solve these issues so read the notes and find out exactly the quality of your data thank you thanks uh, any other comments or questions uh, yeah i i have so, one. yeah yeah so um hi thank you for your uh, presentation I'm, I'm um, interested on, on the limitations on the first studies of migration in the UK um, because and I'm from Portugal and in Portugal we have uh, also a, a lot of uh, youth migration to more coastal territories and um, uh, but uh, and, and I speak for myself and for most of my colleagues that I know um, the use of post postal codes it, it may be a, a limitation and I don't know if you uh, um, also consider that because well I just uh, uh, I just uh, uh, change my postal code like now and I'm working uh, already on, on my PhD so I was like uh, eight years uh, without changing it and I, I was not on my hometown I, I was uh, in my university town. And uh, I know many colleagues of mine that like have 35 years and that work here, but they still have their post co postal code in their uh, hometown in the inland areas. And I don't know if it was a limitation or, or how you uh, um, how you uh, well uh, came across with, with that. So. Okay, uh, first of all. I had data at postal codes, which were very small, but then I aggregated them in kind of larger units. Of, uh, to define a migrant, I had a radius of 20 kilometers, okay? So because otherwise it would have been a problem also if one, one person was moving from one postal code to the other postal code, defined that migrants would have been difficult, uh, what well, would have been wrong actually. But the postal code was, easy, was good because being so small, I could use the centroid and then I could actually, and it, that was a good approximation of where they were because it was so small. And from the centroid, I could then go to the other centroids and measure distances because my migration variable was uh, based on distances moved, not different administrative units. And this is something that I wanted to say because often 
you don't do that. You just define migrants based on administrative units. But then if you are at the border of one and just move maybe one kilometer, you are a migrant and you are not. So using distances, radius is always, I think, better. What you are referring to is a different problem. It's the problem of people that change. In Italy, we have, or we used to have, domicile and residence. So you don't change your residence. You just change your domicile, but you are also always registered with your previous uh, in the UK, this is less of an issue because uh, it's, it's not like in Italy, and I guess it's not like in, in Portugal. When you move to the university, you actually normally uh, go to a hall of residence and you register there. And in a sense, you move the, the both okay. domicile and residence. So that is a little bit less uh, of an issue in this sense. It could be still an issue for international students, but we actually excluded from the initial study that I did in the UK, I only took uh, um, native students. So I, I removed from the sample the international students. And the reason was again, data limitation back then, I had the, the whole UK, the whole British population, let's say, but the international students were more problematic in data collections. So when I was looking at the different years, uh, I could see that they were not consistent. So we removed them. And also because it was very difficult to assess return migration for international students because we didn't have the end point. Once they were leaving the university, I didn't know where they were going to, to work unless they were staying in the UK. So that would have biased my sample. So the international students were removed. Yeah. But yeah, you are right. There is the risk. Again, look at the uh, cultural context where you are, because of course we had this bias in the UK as well. But being Italian and having lived in the UK, that was less of and in the US, that would be less of an issue in the UK and in the US than it is, for instance, in Italy, where nobody ever changes their postal code. I, I did actually, I moved from Milan to L'Aquila and I now reside in L'Aquila, but a lot of people that even work with me, researcher, still have their residence in, in the other. And this is also due to probably, you know, not, not probably, this is also due to the taxation system. So in Italy, if you change your residence, in Italy it is, if you change your residence and you have a house, and you own a house, like in my case in Milan. I own a house in Milan. Now I move my residence in Lapel. I pay higher taxes in my on my house in Milan. So a lot of people don't do that because they want to keep the tax benefits there. This is a bias introduced by, by the taxation system in Italy. Thank you. Any other questions? Any anyone? Please feel free to also use the chat if you prefer. I can see Jorgos and Caroline. Can you see? Uh, Dimitris, I see. I know uh, Caroline. Uh, the, Jorgos was there first. Yeah, Jor they raised their hands. <laughs> oh, Jorgos. Uh, hi. Yeah, Jorgos. <laughs> hi, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to add uh, something on the previous comment uh, made by Felipe when we were discussing about patent data, because my, about actually. Both of my supervisors are working only with innovation, and they were already cited in the presentation of uh, Alessandra. So oh, I want to mention. Who are your Who are your advisors? Uh, Rosina Moreno and uh. Ernest Migueles. Okay, yes, and I also, know them both. <laughs> yes, also I was uh, during June. I was in Utrecht with Carolina, and uh, we were discussing a lot about trademarks. So one, one, I want just to add that one more limitation you have with the patent data always when you are looking mobility and kind of stuff is that in always to look in the mobility you have to, the, the, the inventor has to apply for a patent at least twice in order to identify the, the other location or the, the new location of the inventor. So I, I, it is also one of the limitations that we report also in our paper that Usually, uh, patent data are the underrepresent. Uh, they don't reflect the actual mobility, which is a, a limitation also when you use uh, patent data in order to to identify the mobile inventors. That's all. It's my minor comment. When 
Look. Yeah, yeah, I, I know, I, of course, I know your advisors, <laughs> and I know Carolina, <laughs> well, I kind of work with them. Um, um, and I also know all the work that Forest San Francesco mm -hmm. Lisson is doing on these, using the patents to identify the, it, the, in my research, I'm not actually looking at mobile inventors, I'm only using patents, trademark and design as a location characteristics. But you are absolutely right uh, that that's a limitation when you are trying to identify. I, I'm using students and graduates here, uh, and I'm using actually in, in Italy, um, I'm using the data that come from the registration and the registration of people in the different municipality. And we have that by gender and by um, education, right? We got them from ISTA. They're very detailed uh, data you have to go to a lab to get them whatever but i'm using it the, the, the general population i'm not looking at mobile inventors um, but it's definitely it's absolutely like you said so yeah that is something if you if you're you. using that that is a problem yes thank you very much and uh, we have caroline and then uh, sasa has raised her hand so caroline looks like to um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm also looking at migration in the UK and yeah, the data is a bit, it, it's also a mess as always. Um, but yeah, that was really interesting. So um, I had a question around um, the effects of the migrants on innovation that you showed. And I think you showed the negative effects of the, of the low and mid-skilled migrants on uh, the different measures of innovation. So I was a bit surprised by that because I can understand why there would be no effect um, but how do you explain that there's a, actually a negative effect of those migrants? I guess it depends on the uh, fact that where you have low migrants, probably you also have certain sectors that are not very innovative at all. So my guess is, but it's a guess because I haven't looked at that in particular yet. We are still working on that. But my guess is that there is a composition effect. Um, where you have a lot of low skill migrants, they're used in sectors that are not very innovative. That is my initial guess, but we'll check that. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Sasa? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for the very interesting uh, presentation, uh, Alessandra. Um, I'm working on uh, also environmental economics a bit more, so I was very interested to hear about uh, this uh, working paper and looking forward um, to look at it. Um, so you were looking at um, uh, high skilled uh, versus low skilled and like this effect on the employment, right? And I was wondering, um, because I'm looking a bit more also in terms of the skills that people have or like the, the sector they work in, because you see that this technical skills or these green skills uh, are very important. And I'm looking at the mismatch in, in, in specific regions for that. So I was wondering if you are also looking at this. And another part I was wondering about, so I'm looking also at the potential for renewable energies, for example, in specific regions. And there, what I find in my analysis is that Southern Italian regions are actually have a very high potential, right? For solar energy, for example. And uh, I'm trying to look at whether this also has an employment impact on these regions. And I'm wondering how you see this also from knowing these regions um, better than I do, uh, what you think about this potential and the impact it could have. So the potential, of, I start from the last and then I go back to the first. The potential of the Southern region is great, is really huge. The issue in the Southern region has always been competencies on one side because young people don't wait for these uh, things to be developed because it takes quite a while. They study and then they, they leave. They, they all wanna go and find a job immediately. They go to the North. The second problem is that the investment in the South of Italy are not very used in a very efficient, effective uh, way. We had that problem in the past with the cohesion funds. Um, and, but the potential is huge. And uh, so now we'll see the, 
we have the PNRR, Piano Nazionale di Resilienza and Recovery. So it's the National Plan for Resilience and Recovery. Uh, of course, puts a lot of focus on uh, um, digital and green skills and technology, and also on the um, um, gap between territorial gaps between the North and the South. So the idea is that a huge amount of this money will be spent in the South and a little bit in the center with the focus of helping with uh, digital and uh, and green. In a sense, we should observe uh, some of this potential, at least with this inflow of money coming in, which is massive, if well spent, if we manage to have uh, institutions that don't waste this money and finally invest that in a productive, good way, we should really see some of this potential coming up because uh, we are not in austerity, we are the opposite now. So it's, and these are two of the focus, focuses of the FOCAI, I should say, of, of the national plan. The first one, I don't remember what you asked me now. Uh, about the, the high versus low education or the skills approach. So ah, yeah, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yes, so I, <laughs> I'm not, lucky you, so we would have overlapped otherwise. I'm not looking at the competencies, especially in the green sector. I am, however, looking at competencies. I have been looking at competencies in the um, fracking sector in the US. So we were looking at this natural gas development and with the students of mine, we just submitted a, a paper which was looking exactly at that. The competencies, but not generated by the green sector, but generating by this new development in fracking uh, in, the, in the US. And we did find, by the way, that it was the intermediate skills especially that were needed and were lacking. So I don't know if that is something similar to the, the green sectors or, or whatever. And we were using the ONET survey mm -hmm. in, the, in the US. I don't know what's the, the equivalent in Europe. I'm also starting working um, on a, with a PhD students at the University of Perugia who is uh, looking into competencies, but of migrants, uh, different, not green. So yes, I'm look, working on camp, but not, not on green. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? I can't see any hands. Uh, please feel free to, oh, Eleonora, yes. Hi, Alessandra. Hey. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I was wondering if you have uh, really some opinion uh, on the fact that this COVID situation could have changed the path of migrants, limiting especially the low medium skilled migrants from entering other countries and what you think it could happen also related to your first research that you showed today. Hi Eleonora, first of all I know Eleonora. <laughs> um, I think that, okay, this is my feeling, of course, in the short term, it was more difficult for these migrants to move around. But uh, let's, let's uh, specify what we mean by low medium skills migrant, because if we mean migrants by necessity, so the ones that come on a boat in the Mediterranean and land in Sicily, I think that these will always be desperate. So the fact that there is COVID or non-COVID, it's not going to stop them. We saw a slowdown of this in 2020, but we've already uh, seen an increase in the last couple of months. Yesterday, another, what, 20, 25 people died in the Mediterranean trying to come over. Uh, and so I, you know that because you are Italian like me, the news on the death in the Mediterranean intensified in the last month. The summer comes and they start coming. They don't really, they are so past the point, uh, I, I guess these people are so desperate that they are so past the point of worrying about COVID. If they decide to put their kids on a boat and run the risk of dying in the sea, I don't think they're thinking about COVID. And in fact, if anything, they know that if they manage to come to Italy, now we have this program and we are pushing for migrants to be vaccinated too. So in a sense, uh, I'm not saying that this could be an incentive because I don't really think they're thinking about this. I think they're doing it because they're desperate. And when you're desperate, you don't really think about anything else. Um, 
but my feeling is that yes if if by low medium skill we think these people i i think that in 2021 we will assist we will see more people coming and uh, and if we don't do anything about the environmental problem the the flow the flows will increase uh, and we are in fact i think that during the covid we were so concentrated on facing COVID that we kind of forgot about international uh, migration and, and the migrants crisis, but it never went away, if that's what you mean by low medium skill. The ones that are kind of more like medium high, yes, you know, they, they have a different uh, utility function, different preferences, and they might be slowing down in terms in term of mobility. For instance, you know, I'm just talking about our PhD program. We, we had a lot more Italian applicants that didn't want to go and study elsewhere. We had fewer European uh, migrants that didn't want to come to Italy because they were scared but because they have the luxury of thinking about this. I don't think that these low, medium skill that have expert have the luxury of thinking about the COVID effect. Thanks, uh, Alessandra. Any, uh, Eleonora, do you have a follow-up or no, no? Any other questions or comments? Uh, Cars, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I really liked it, especially as yesterday I presented something about spatial patterns regarding uh, university students in the Netherlands. And I, I noticed a bit that my research also falls in, well, a larger pattern of much research on uh, migration and human capital focusing on university students or international students, interregional um, patterns like university students moving to London and there is less talk maybe about um, the migration decisions of of low and medium skilled uh, students and people who all often move at a well, well less distance so I was wondering do you really do you think as an established scholar in this field that that's really the interesting thing the 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 top performing students the patterns or maybe we should maybe also look within London uh, about uh, how local uh, or low uh, low skilled um, um, people make decisions regarding migration and their jobs. Um, maybe or or do you really think okay the future of research uh, or regions is um, we should really look at these more um, high skilled um, better. So partially I've answered your question by looking at what we are uh, studying in Italy right now, having the data also on not just the high skill, but also the, the low medium skill, we are looking at both. The reason why in the UK I was looking at the highly skilled is because I had the data on the whole student population. And so I focused on that. But also the reason why there is a lot more focus on say uh, inventor mobility right now or uh, high human capital, it's because that these are the people that normally a region wants to attract or retain because they're linked to a better labor market in a sense, right? So it's more that the kind of policy issue of looking at, in a sense, uh, the, the most looked at categories are the two extreme. Either the very highly skilled one, because these are the ones that help you with your economy, or you look at the international immigrants, maybe refugee crisis and so on, because these are the ones that scare you the most. <laughs> And you are right that maybe the ones in the middle, the average people are less looked at, uh, although there are a lot of studies that look at the migration of the general population or the, the study that I was looking at, I showed you the maps. Uh, we are also looking at the low medium uh, skill ones and we're looking at the effect that they have, for instance, on the local labor market. It's, it's worth studying them all. And if you have data on the whole population and you can subdivide them by skill groups, by any means, look at them as well. The only thing is uh, look at them maybe separately because one of the things I've noticed is that the flows of highly skilled and low medium skills not always even go in the same direction. They, they go into different, uh, obviously, um, 
areas, at least in Italy, and, and different uh, uh, labor markets. In terms of what you said about the um, internal flows within London, I'm not sure if I understood correctly, you wanted to look at the finer level and look at the redistribution within London? Well, for example, I think in London, you have the same phenomena as in, for example, Amsterdam, where they actually have difficulty in uh, finding houses for primary school teachers or for, for cleaning stuff. Uh, in these big, well, maybe successful cities. And um, uh, maybe that's a story that we might forget if we're in the university building studying uh, the high skilled people, that there's also patterns there related to human capital, to jobs, to um, mobility. So there is a contribution actually by Phil Graves in the Handbook of Regional Science. There is a second edition that just came out. I don't remember. The, the, the year of the first one, probably 2017, but it's in both. And he's actually, it's interesting because he's looking at different phenomena that he thinks are understudied. And one of the, it's like a menu list, right? It's, it's useful because uh, you can kind of look at them and go, oh, I can do this, I can do this, it's kind of like a menu, right? Um, and one of the things that he mentions is exactly what you're saying. So this, um, he's talking about more like LA or the US, but this phenomenon of migration of the low skill to offer services to the high skilled with the problem though, that they need to be paid, overpaid, even if they are low skilled, because otherwise they can't afford uh, like to, to rent a house and stuff like that. Um, so maybe you feel Graves, G-R-A-V-E-S, uh, in the Handbook of Regional Science, uh, and you can see what he says about the phenomenon that you're looking at. Thanks, Annie. We have a bit of time for more questions or comments, if there are. Can't see any hands, but uh, anyone? I have. Uh, oh, uh, was there any? No, I can't. I'm looking at both the screen and the and the hands, but I can't see anything. Uh, please let me know if I missed anyone. But I do have a, a question, Alessandra, on uh, uh, the earlier work uh, in the, in the UK that you mentioned, that, and and also to some extent this relates to the Facebook, the big data. Did you consider using uh, linking the postcodes to geodemographic classifications to look at the aspiration, the type of neighborhood people come from. And also, I don't know if you had data on the parents of the students, what kind of income, background, that kind of thing. I wonder if you consider that because this reminded me of when I taught at the University of Sheffield, my colleague Dan Vickers, who created the first open geodemographic classification for the UK. He got some anonymized data of all of the students at the University of Sheffield and the postcodes, and we could link it to where students from different areas, professional suburbs, whether they study medical sciences or geography. So I wonder if you thought about that and uh, whether there's anyone who might take it on. And then in relation to Facebook, I, it's a bit iffy there, but you could maybe look at some people put the job description in their Facebook profile. So I wonder if that could be used somehow to have some extra information on what kind of background they have. But you don't know the individual data. Well, I don't, I don't know what you get. Uh, if you can get anonymized, I'm not really that familiar with what you get from... Uh, uh, okay, let's start from the first yeah. one. So yeah. the first one, I know that classification very well. And of course, I thought of using it in my PhD. But at that time, it was well beyond what I could do alone. So I kind of, you know, finished my PhD. I remember Phil always saying to me, you're not trying to win the Nobel Prize, you're trying to finish your PhD. My PhD is very long already. So uh, I, of course I, I thought about doing it. Uh, I didn't come around simply because I didn't have time. Uh, when I eventually could have done that, <laughs> few issues were that I left the UK because I didn't have access to the data anymore. The second issue was that after my PhD, uh, the data from HISA, and I don't know, if, I mean, that is what I, I was told by uh, Sarah Jewell, who is still my co-author and used to be a PhD student of mine, now is at the University of Reading. Um, so she told me that after my PhD, they stopped releasing the data at postcode level because they realized that 2 million postcode level were too fine and there were possible problems with anonymity. So in a sense, back then, 
I didn't have very powerful computers, but I had the data because the privacy issue didn't kick in yet. I finished my PhD, the private, we had better computers, but then the privacy issues started being an issue. So, so in the, the data, the more recent data, I don't have them at this finer level. We have much larger geographical level. And that is part also of the reason why then I moved on. I, I stopped working on this. It would have been very nice to look at the longer time series. In the meantime, there was the crisis. Now there is the COVID. If we could have the whole series of 20 years, that would be fantastic. But they're not compatible anymore because they don't give me the data at that level of detail. So that's why I've never done it. First, because I didn't have time, then because I didn't have the data. So that was the, but it would be great if we had the data because now I have lots of students, postdoc and whatever that could easily you know, work on topics like that. And that would be incredibly interesting because it's a lot of information on this uh, uh, thing. Uh, the second on Facebook, it would be great. Yes, we could do some text analysis, but we don't even know who they are. All we know is they give you aggregate data on the movements, the flows between and within municipality three, three times a day in the morning, in the afternoon, and in the evening. So when they go to work during the day and basically uh, around 5 p.m. when they leave work. Uh, we, but we don't know who they are. And in a sense, it makes sense because uh, otherwise, as you said, you could connect all this information back in. They, they... Yeah. yeah. So that's the issue. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't imply that you could have. Uh, it, it's quite a massive task to do that with the demographics. I was just thinking as a follow up. And uh, oh no, no. I mean, the, I, yeah. I would still love to do it yeah. if if there was a way to get the HISA to yeah. release the data again at postcode level. Yeah. That would be a great yeah. study to be yeah. done, but uh, I guess you will yeah. need to be there and probably you know know somebody at his yeah. or maybe go into a labs or whatever. Which of course from here it's very difficult. Yeah. But that was my issue that stopped mm. me from doing it. No, but it would be great. It would. Be it might, might be an idea for people taking uh, doing the summer school. Uh, I know some of them are based in the UK, so it might be something that you might want to consider for further studies to build on that work, revisit it. Yeah. Uh, Go oh, there and knowing the is until they give you the data at a finer level. If you can. <laughs> uh, I'm a bit conscious of, of time uh, because I know that Alessandra has a, another very important commitment at 11 and uh, it would be nice to give her a few minutes break before that. But if there's any very quick comments or questions, we could take it, I think. But uh, otherwise, I think we could bring that session to a close and uh, i would like to thank again uh, alessandra i'll be back after lunch i promise and, I and alessandra is joining meeting. us again in the in, in the career afternoon yes i was going to say that so you have a chance to also follow up uh, any any questions and i hello andrea I see andrea has joined us as well good to see you and uh, thanks again uh, ever so much alessandra and everyone for contributing to this uh, discussion and uh, we have now we now have a break and another student session at 11 30 and we will see alessandra again later yeah we'll see you later thank you enjoy thank you nice very much. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Bye. Bye.